So we're talking about where is the healing? Um, something I, again, I used to be, I, I didn't used to be a believer, I used to be an atheist, and I uh, would have challenged Christians on this, who came to me, again, I wouldn't go out and pursue Christians and attack them, but when one would come to me, um, I remember an old uh, website, it was like, why, um, why doesn't God heal amputees? That was one of them, and you know, as, as in Christians, you know, essentially this question, where where's the healing? Because it seems that the Bible promises healing for people of faith, but it seems like, uh, just like everyone else, um, they get sick, people of faith get sick, they suffer, they die. So where is God's healing? Um, did he forget his promise? Maybe he, maybe he forgot, right? Maybe he forgot he made the promise, and, or um, did he, maybe he made a promise he couldn't keep, like he really wanted to, he really, really wanted to keep people well and, and heal them, but he just couldn't keep it, or... Um, or maybe it just doesn't exist. Uh, maybe the reason the Bible uh, promises healing and doesn't deliver it, so it seems, is because the God of the Bible doesn't exist. Um, so we're going to look at that this morning and and then hopefully have some good questions, because as you know, Carrie, that's my favorite part, is it talking and answering people's questions. I don't like to be a monologue, but I love to dialogue with people. So we'll get started, though. Where is the healing? Uh, so what does the Bible say? Well, here are a couple really um, I, I, verses I run into a lot of times when I talk to people and they talk about healing. Um, these will be very, very common verses brought up about, um, especially the idea that God will always heal. He'll just heal me. He'll heal the people of faith. And uh, either maybe if you're, you've run into some religious people who say, well, if God doesn't heal you, it's because you didn't have enough faith or somebody didn't have enough faith or um Maybe, again, you'll run into someone who doesn't believe and will say, well, look, the Bible says you'll be healed if you have faith and you're not being healed. And either you don't have faith or the Bible's untrue. And so here's what, here's a couple of verses we see. One is found in James 5, uh, 13 through 16. It says this, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. And uh, the other one I come across all the time, um, I mean, I hear this all the time from people who are hoping for a healing, or believe they're going to receive a healing, or believe they have received a healing, and uh, they'll share Isaiah 53, 5, which says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. So again, you see there in these two Bible verses what appears quite plainly um, to be statements of absolute healing. Uh, what does James say? Well, such a prayer offering faith will heal the sick. What do you read in Isaiah? Isaiah, that by the punishment brought upon him, Jesus, uh, and his wounds, we are healed. So what do these, what does the Bible say? Well, it seems to say quite openly uh, that someone whose faith will be healed. Um, so here's the problem, right? <laughs> the Bible promises physical healing for God's people and doesn't deliver. Boom, right? That's, that's it. Boom. So God isn't real. And the Bible isn't true. That's the conclusion I think we have to make uh, if it's true that the Bible promises physical healing for God's people and doesn't deliver. Then, boom, the, the, uh, that's it, right? Uh, the atheist position is correct, or uh, God isn't real and the Bible isn't true. Well, there's this. We're going to go into some of the problems with the thinking. There is this. Um, the overall idea in what I'm going to say here is the Bible seems pretty open about the fact that people don't always get healed. A matter of fact, um, the people in the Bible who were healed at one point are no longer with us, so they eventually died. But here's this. This is Galatians. And so the book of Galatians was written by a, a dude named Paul, a guy named Paul. And uh, he's wrote over a dozen books of the New Testament. So he's a, he's a Christian author. <laughs> he's a biblical author, and he's a follower of Christ. And uh, he's one of the heroes of the Christian faith. Everyone knows this. So Paul says, you know, it was because of a bodily ailment. 
something wrong with my body. He says, it was because there was something wrong with me. So I had a sickness, something with my health. It was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. So clearly, Paul doesn't think it's problematic that he's sick. A matter of fact, he in Galatians here, he's saying, listen, uh, however it worked out, it was because I had this ailment that I was with you and I preached the gospel to you at first. And it, the condition was a trial. So apparently he needed some care. Uh, as Again, if you've ever known someone who's sick or, or you've been sick, obviously, or injured, or they need care. And so it could be a trial. Um, my uh, father, when I was younger, uh, in my late teens, early 20s, he became um, sick with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible illness. And um, as it progressed, he could barely do anything for himself. Um, his muscles went weak. His mind stayed strong, but his muscles all failed him. His nerve system fails him. And um, he could no longer take care of himself at all at some point. I mean, it started where he could barely talk and then he could walk. And um, I just remember what a trial that was for my mom who loved him so dearly. She, um, We had people who'd come in the house and do hospice care and care for him. And then my mom would um, take the painstaking task of feeding him. Um, he couldn't swallow whole food anymore. Food needed to be ground up and fed carefully. Um, he could no longer um, take care of his hygiene. And so everything that comes with that, my mom had to do. Sometimes we'd step up and do it was a real trial uh, for us. And that's what happens. But here um, we see that Paul had some sort of bodily ailment. And, and maybe it's connected to 2 Corinthians here below. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 10 says, Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am uh, strong. Excuse me. So here we see again, this is Paul again, and he had some sort of thorn in his flesh. Now, there's discussion about what this could be, whether this was uh, something painful and physical or whether this was maybe someone or something spiritual, we don't know. Um, but I think what we tied into Galatians there, we know at least at some point, Paul had something wrong with his body, and that would be my interpretation as well, that this was something in his body. Um, but what, what do we see very clearly, Paul says, he pleaded, right? He pleaded to the Lord, right? So he went to the Lord in prayer, that's how you plead to the Lord, to take it away. Um, and what happened? God said, no. He said, my grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect in weakness. And uh, in a sense, and this is not going to be what I talk about the rest, but in a sense here, we see Paul's healing immediately. Because when God responds with no, that he's not going to take away the physical pain or whatever this is, the thorn in his side, um, Paul's response is, makes me glad. <laughs> I'm going to boast about it. He goes, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So God didn't heal him by changing his pain or his circumstances. God changed his perspective. And I do believe um, that if we were to ask Paul, he would say he was healed. Um, because exactly, um, his plea was taken away from me. And his healing was, I want to keep it now. <laughs> like, and, and did you also see uh, the reason for that, that Paul understood the reason this happened? Now, this isn't the universal reason, okay? But do you hear what Paul said? He said, in order to keep me from being conceited, Paul been given these visions, and I'm not going to go into that. But Paul says, in order to, be, to keep me from being conceited. So there was a reason for whatever whatever unhealthiness, uh, whatever pain, whatever needed healing, Paul, there was good reason coming to God, and Paul recognized that. Um, so again, the Bible doesn't hide the fact. It doesn't say, well, everyone's going to get healed, and then 
and then tries to cover up that you know everyone who is sick it doesn't have faith or everyone who uh, is sick or, you know they never end up dying they they disappeared into some ether no um <laughs> the bible's very open about this um, people get sick um, get, uh, so so again going back to to this the bible pro the bible promises physical healing for god's people and doesn't deliver boom right um well that's not what the actual bible teaches and again the bible doesn't try and cover this up paul writes about it openly that he's sick um and, and that he has not been physically healed in the way we see physical healing and here's what i want to say um the reason uh when we talk about healing and think about healing um, in God's perspective, he isn't simply talking, the idea of healing isn't simply talking about tent repair. And the reason I say tent repair, you see the picture of the old tattered tent. I kind of, I laugh and smile when I see this picture because um, if you see there in 2 Corinthians 5.1, it says our earthly bodies are temporary and easily torn like a tent. So our earthly bodies, this body is temporary and easily torn like a tent. And like I said, I smile when I see that picture of a tent because I'm like, that looks like my body. I mean, not physically. I mean, obviously I don't look like a tent, but, but that's how I feel. Like that tent's got the tatter at the bottom and it's torn up top and it just looks like it could fall apart at any moment. And I remember when I was younger and I certainly didn't feel that way. I felt like I was a perfectly built tent. And, <laughs> and as I've aged, uh, poor choices sin um, have have <laughs> kind of tore my tent and ripped me apart. I feel I I very much identify with this tent. So sorry for thanks for letting me laugh because I just find that so true. I look at this tent, I see me. But God is simply offering tent repair, right? He says so. So again, in Second Corinthians, it says our earthly bodies are temporary and easily torn. That's a tent, right? It's a tent is a temporary place. Um, you know, uh, here in America. Uh, people use tents primarily for camping, uh, so they'll have a tent room with them somewhere and set it for camping, and then you take it down and you go back to the place you really live. Um, sometimes we do have people, again, in, in the American culture who live in tents if they don't have a home or they're nomadic, and, and again, um, but a tent is not meant to be their permanent dwelling space. If you own some land and and you can build better, right, if you can't afford to, but if you own some land, it, you generally don't build a tent, you build something much nicer. So God isn't simply offering tent repair. When God talks about healing, he's not simply offering tent repair. He has built us a mansion. Um, Jesus went and has prepared a place for us. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians. Let's go on. So our earthly bodies are like a tent, temporary and easily torn, uh, like I showed that picture and, and I really identify with. But listen to what uh, the author Paul says, he says, but we have an indestructible home in heaven made by God. So we have this tent here. This is our body, this tent. And uh, and it's nice. We like it when it's repaired. We, we like it when it's patched up. We like it when it doesn't uh, wither at the bottom and the sun doesn't fade it. Um, but God isn't in the business of tent repair. What, what has he done? He has built us a mansion. We have an indestructible home in heaven made by God. And uh, that tells us something that the Bible truly teaches, and that's that as long as we're in our mortal bodies, as long as we're in these bodies here, there will be pain and suffering and sickness. Uh, and this makes us long for our heavenly bodies, right? Knowing that when this body is gone, this body I have right now, uh, I will be in the presence of God. And in a new body, I'll, I'll, I'll have left the tent and be in a mansion. I thought this mansion, by the way, was, if you see, can see, I thought this one was pretty cool. Uh, and I want a pool, too. I think there'll be a pool by the mansion. I'm hoping. I love water. So, um, so again, uh, God isn't simply offering tent. Uh, we look at this tent and could maybe sew back together the top or stitch something over it. And I could clean up the bottom or even almost completely rebuild the thing. But the fact is, I'm still in a tent. Um, he has built us a mansion, and not just a mansion like we build here on earth, but an indestructible, indestructible home, uh, a perfect body, a heavenly spiritual body. Um, I really don't even know what that looks like, uh, really, but it's just, I'm excited. And sick, sickness, excuse me, sickness and suffering and death. And, uh, but I long because I know in this, this earthly body, um, is gone. I'll I'll have this indestructible home with God. Have um, 
So does God heal people physically? Does God heal people? Or is it all uh, this idea that, okay, is the idea or, or, you know, outside of stuff, does God heal people? Yes. You see the lady emphatically. <laughs> yes. Uh, Psalm 103.3 says, he forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. Um, and absolutely, um, I can speak myself as someone who leaves the Bible. I believe that God heals people. I, I believe uh, physically heals people, mentally, spiritually, all those things too. But I'm talking about physically today. That's the one that's easiest to see manifest before us, right? If it happens is, so does God physically heal people? Yes, God physically heals people. He has throughout time. Um, God still physically heals people today, just as he did in the beginning, just as he did in the time of Jesus, just as he'll do through his return. Uh, God heals people, and um, I get to see it all the time, and so do you. Uh, whether you believe in God or not, you get to see God healing people all the time. All, all the time we see God heal people. Because what the Bible teaches actually, so actually what the Bible teaches is that all healing comes from God. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that there, there's uh, other sources of healing and then there's miraculous God healing. The Bible teaches that all healing comes from God. God is the source of life. God is life himself and all healing comes from him. Um, and you may not agree with this, understand. Uh, so if you're not an unbeliever, uh, you may say, well, that's an easy way out. You know, you could say, well, you could have that thought and, 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 and that's great. Um, but we're talking about what the Bible teaches. And um, because we start off saying, hey, if, if the Bible teaches that God heals all people physically all the time who have faith and he isn't doing that, there's something wrong. But what the Bible actually teaches is that all healing comes from God. And if that's true, then it doesn't matter what faith you are or aren't. You have seen God heal people. So what about doctors in medicine, right? Because that's, I'm just, um, so, you know, if you're a sensitive Christian, close your ears. But this is the most common way I've seen God heal people <laughs> is, is through the medicine, through your immune system, right? Which got in place. Um, but God didn't just put the inner immune system in place. God is the God of medicine. So what about doctors in medicine? Well, most of us hopefully have seen God heal something or uh, fix a problem or at least alleviate some pain uh, through medicine. And so is that a problem for the Bible? Does the Bible say, well, don't take medicine, that's not of God? Uh, does the Bible say, if you're a person of faith, you shouldn't need medicine? And does the Bible, what's the Bible teach about medicine? Well, in 1 Timothy 5.23, um, which is written to a pastor of the church, Timothy, who's a man of faith, um, and, and what he's instructed to do is to stop drinking only water and use a little wine. Why use wine? Because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. So, so wine, uh, alcohol, wine, <laughs> was a medicine at the time. And uh, we still use it actually in medicine today. <clears throat> but, and so he's instructed, the, the response of the, Paul again, the response of the author isn't um, pray and be healed. The response of the author isn't, um, you must not have faith, you must have sin, you're sick. The response of the author is, take some medicine. Take some medicine. Why? Because you're, you have a stomach issue of some kind and you're frequently ill. So uh, what else is this telling us? Well, a man of faith, a man of God was frequently ill. Um, it didn't seem to stop him from being ill, the fact that he was a man of God. And, and Paul's, Paul's advice is, is what? Take your medicine. So the Bible isn't ashamed that doctors and medicine have a place in healing in this world. The Bible embraces it. It doesn't try and hide it. It doesn't try and uh, cover it up. It, it, it embraces it. Take, take your medicine. Matter of fact, in Mark 2.17, Jesus says it's, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. He says that sick people, he understands this is, remember, in the Christian faith, we believe Jesus is God in the flesh, God walking on this earth. And so what does God on this earth say? Well, the sick need doctors. Uh, it, it would be a terrible, Jesus uses that as an illustration, understand, it'd be a terrible illustration if he himself didn't believe it. Uh, he says that uh, it's not the healthy that need doctors, but the sick, the sick doctors. So what about doctors in medicine? Well, the Bible says, take your medicine, see your doctor. Uh, why? Because the Bible isn't ashamed. The Bible says that all healing comes from God. And how do we get there? So this is the idea. It's science. And I, I love science. Um, 
man, I couldn't be speaking to you today without the gift of science. It's incredible. Um, technology comes from the scientific disciplines and studies. And, and uh, isn't it incredible that some of you might be in Europe, places all over the world, and I'm sitting here in Ohio in America, and we're talking because of the wonderful gift of scientific discovery and scientific knowledge. <laughs> and, and so science isn't the enemy to any believer of Christ, any uh, follower of God, any student of the Bible. Uh, it's, it's a very simple thing to understand. It's that science discovered it, right? Science discovered things. Uh, you know, um, the formula, and I know that's the wrong word, so you can jump, but whatever, to, to make an antibiotic isn't found in the Bible. Um, penicillin isn't described in the Bible how to get there. Science discovered it. That's okay. Um, because I believe it was God put it there for science to discover. The idea is this science discovered it, God makes it work. And I, I uh, and, and just claiming that's the biblical, biblical teaching is that science discovered, but God makes it work. I might have to back it up in the Bible, right? I can't just say that. And, and so I want to look at the story here. Um, when Jesus runs into a blind guy, it's found in John 9. So you see John 9, 1 through 7. So he uh, he was walking along, right? He, he saw a man, and he was blind from birth. And so his disciples, Jesus' crew, his followers, uh, they, they ask him, they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So we see one thing in their understanding that's already correct, incorrect, excuse me, is they believe that either he had a sin or his parents had a sin, and that's why this guy's suffering. And Jesus cuts that out of the idea right away. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Uh, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Uh, so this wasn't because of sin. This is happening so that what? So that Jesus can show us how God works. Did you catch that? What's Jesus say? Jesus says, this man is sick so that God can show you how he works in healing. And watch how he works. Watch this. After saying this, he spit it on the man's eyes. And then Jesus said, go wash in the pool of sight. When the man did it, he came home seeing. Uh, so this is just incredible because if, if you see what's happening here. So what does Jesus do? Well, again, Jesus says, this guy is sick so that I can show you the way God works. And when he, he says that, this is, I'm going to show you how God works. And what does he do? He actually is making medicine. Okay. So this thought of spitting on the ground, making and putting on the eyes was like an, an anointing, an ointment on the eyes that they would have believed, hey, this is this is the way somebody might get healed of something. And, and my guess is um, that sometimes people would spit on the ground and put mud on their eyes and it, it worked for something. Uh, matter of fact, there's a whole industry uh, of charlatans that sell snake oil and it's built on the, the whole premise of the placebo effect and stuff like that, that Man, if enough people try this, it'll work on some, and it may just work on some because they think it works on them, but it'll still work. But anyway, what's Jesus saying? Here's, here's how God works. He spits on the ground and makes the mud, right? And he sends that, he sends him to the pool of Siloam, another thing where they thought, hey, go wash off in this pool. It has healing properties, healing powers. So Jesus does it, and it works. And it wasn't just a temporary condition. That's, that's why this is important. That's why Jesus points out this was a man who was blind from birth. You notice the Bible says that? The Bible is incredible in that it covers every detail. So we understood that this wasn't, this wasn't a placebo effect. This wasn't, you know, the guy got, had a cold and Jesus gave him the medicine and he was cured. And like so many other people know, this was a man blind from birth. This guy had a birth defect. And Jesus uses medicine to make him well, medicine of the time. Why? Because, yes, yeah, science discovered medicine, but God makes it work. Without God, the medicine doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, God is the one who made the medicine work. And very clearly, again, uh, that's very clearly what this passage, what this uh, part, uh, this time in Jesus' life is showing. Again, it goes out of the way to say he was blind from birth. It goes out of the way to say that this was so God can show you how he works, that God's power can be displayed in him, right? And he goes and makes the medicine and has them wash off in the pool. Again, medicine, medicine. So what about doctors in medicine? Well, 
The Bible says, take your medicine. The Bible's not afraid of medicine. And it, and it says, science discovered, God makes it work. God makes the medicine work. Um, what about heal when healing comes slowly? Um, we see the little icon there we're all familiar with where we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, it happens to me all the time. My computer gets me frustrated. Uh, and waiting's hard. Um, waiting's very hard. My son, Christopher, uh, got yeah, something called Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS. And um, it came on quickly. <laughs> uh, it was surprising how quickly it came on. He was had kind of a cold, you know, a little, little bit of a cold one day. And a couple of days later, he was quadriplegic. That means he couldn't move his arms, his legs. He couldn't use any of his muscles. Um, he could barely talk. It reminded me a lot of my dad who had this Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, actually. Um, and so Lisa and I, as people of faith, we pray for healing. And what we wanted was immediate healing. That's what we wanted. When I was praying, um, I was praying for God to heal, and I was willing to accept anything that came from God. But my want, my desire, my hope, my prayer was that he would just be healed instantly. By the time you know he had to be taken over in an emergency ambulance over to another hospital. And my prayer I, in the car as I'm driving behind, Lisa, my wife Lisa, Lisa was in there with him is God heal him right now. Like by the time he gets to the hospital, let them him just walk out of that ambulance, like give glory to God, he'd be healed. Um, but it didn't happen that way. It came very slowly. He was in the hospital 38 days over Thanksgiving and Christmas, which is a big deal uh, in the States, um, Christmas. And uh, he, he, so he missed out on a lot of stuff. The family missed out on a lot of stuff. And, it, and then after that, it took him years, literally years of physical therapy and, and recovery to get back to even close to where he was. And I, the process really does still go on. So is that of God? I mean, God could have just healed him instantly. Um, no, he, I mean, he went to the doctor, took medicine, physical rehabil physical rehab. What about when healing comes slowly? Yep, it's still God at work. I believe it, but not. I don't just believe it because it's a fun thought or it's comforting. I believe it because it's what the Bible teaches. Matter of fact, uh, again, Jesus, who is our living example, Jesus is the one who me as a Christian, I turn to in my faith to look how to live and how God moves. Um, it says that Jesus, uh, they, you see in Mark 8, 22 through 26 here. Okay, so they come to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. So he put the man by the hand outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes, sound familiar? Medicine, right? And put his hands on him. Jesus asked, do you see anything? That's a weird question, right? Because, uh, again, not just because I say so, but because we've seen examples in the Bible, the very Bible where this healing is happening. We've seen examples of Jesus healing someone without even being there, without even being present, right? We, we've seen this. But here, Jesus, again, does the medicine thing. And then he answers, do you see anything? And listen to what the guy says. He says, uh, he looks up and he says, I pe see people. They look like trees walking around. So he sees them, but he doesn't see them clearly. He can't really identify them as people. They're just kind of these trees, these pillars kind of walking around. It'd be a, be a funny thought. And so what happens? Well, it's interesting because God cho cho chose to demonstrate in this instance that what about when healing comes slowly? What about when it doesn't happen all at one time? Um, and again, now in the story, see, so once more, Jesus puts his hands in the man's eyes and his eyes were open. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. So this guy gets healed. But listen, it's step by step. You see that? He's getting healed step by step. It takes two steps. Uh, why? Again, Jesus can heal any way he wants. God could just... You know, say the word, I'm healed. That's true of God. So why in this instance does it take a few steps? Well, it's a very simple lesson for us all to understand is sometimes God heals in steps. That's still God at work. The Bible doesn't try and cover up that fact. It doesn't make excuses for it. it. shows clearly through the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, right, that he works in steps even. Um, God can heal however he wants. It's still God at work. In fact, uh, we see in the Bible that it's never too late for God to heal. Um, and and uh, I've known, that, actually, anyway, I can't, um, several instances of people who were long down a road, um, 
and I, I can't, they're not here with me, but um, you can believe me or not, but you've been cured of things like cancer and um, cured of things, dementia, all, I mean, all sorts of things. And the reason I'm bringing these things up is because times where it really looked too late. I mean, it, 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 even me as a believer, listen, I'm a believer and I'm in total faith that I can do anything, but I also live in a world where I see that at a certain point when someone has cancer, they tend to die. Uh, at a certain point when someone has dementia, they're gone. Um, and so I live in that world. So I do believe it's never too late for God to heal. But of course, I live in a world where I, 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 I go, oh, man, this, this looks tough. Like it's going to take something insane to happen here. Um, but in fact, it's never too late to God to heal. For God to heal, we see that in many places throughout scripture. But uh, I find this one quite interesting in Matthew 9, 20 through 22. It says, just then a woman, so Jesus is walking through some crowds here, had been subject to bleeding for, who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. So this lady, it's been a while. <laughs> um, and I'm guessing... <laughs> Her friends and family, they thought it was too late. Uh, she thought it was too late. She's just going to bleed forever. Uh, she'd been bleeding for 12 years. Um, and But she says to herself, hey, Jesus is here. And man, if I just touch his cloak, I'll be healed. She believes in Jesus. And she goes, you know, nothing else has worked. But you know what she's saying? She's saying it's never too late for God. That's what she means. It's never too late for God. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed. Uh it's never too late for God to heal. And, and again, this could be at the hands of the doctors at medicine. Maybe uh, we actually, I'll tell you a real quick story. We have a friend right now who has in fact been paralyzed for years and years. And I don't, I don't remember the number. And uh, she just got uh, invited into this um, uh, study. It's a um, like experimental surgery and and it looks, I mean, we've actually, she's actually able to move her leg. It looks like she's going to be able to move again someday. It was impossible just a few years ago. It's never too late for God to heal, um, even when the doctors fall short. Um, and that's the good news. That's a hope we have. And listen to this. So we're talking about the same woman here. She's been bleeding for 12 years, and this is the account of it in Mark. So listen to what they, what Mark uh, makes sure we understand. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all the money she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So again, looking at looking at it's too late is, is this woman had, had gone to the doctors, invested everything in getting well. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. And you know what? She wasn't getting better. She was getting worse. But it's never too late for God to heal. Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. It is never too late for God to heal, even when the doctors fall short. God uses doctors and medicine. God heals in stages, in steps, and God can heal even when medicine and the doctors fall short. God heals. God is the source of what? All healing. That's what I believe. But here's an interesting dilemma, <laughs> right here, here. Here's, and honestly, this is something I would have said as a non-believer. Um, so let's say, sure, the Christian makes a case that they get healed in this way and through time and all those things like I was just saying. Um, well, here's what I'd say. God doesn't just heal his people, right? So it looks like it's the same as if there were no God at all, because, right, because if no, there was no God at all and there was healing, you'd expect that people of faith would get healed the same way that people of non-faith would get healed. And if we're Christians and we're being honest, <laughs> People without faith get healed all the time. A matter of fact, there have been people without faith who get healed of, of serious, deadly things. Of course, there are people without faith who get healed at the hands of doctors and surgeons, and also through their immune system, and also in ways we don't know that we would call miracles, but who knows, right? They don't have faith. So if God doesn't heal just his people, it looks the same as if there were no God at all. Well... <laughs> First, I want to say something just uh, just came to mind now, but that just kind of a um, true statement is if God exists, and I believe he does, of course, that's my position. Um, so let's say he does. Um, how would you know what it's like to have no God at all? In other words, uh, according to the Bible, there would be no healing at all without God. 
like so that's what it looked like is it wouldn't look like sick people uh, like people of faith and people of non-faith getting healed it would look like no one getting healed um of course no one would exist so we have to go back there too but but what does the bible actually teach okay so god doesn't just heals people so then it looks like there's no god at all right so what is what does the bible actually teach and it says the bible actually teaches this okay actually what the bible teaches is this and so in john 5 uh 1 through 9 we read a story and Jesus is by a pool of water that people thought had healing properties, right? Uh, people had healed there before. And, and so there was this guy there and he'd been an invalid. He'd been like disabled for 38 years. Uh, and he was laying, he was laying there by the pool, like waiting to get in. Uh, and so Jesus asked him, he says, do you want to get well? Jesus offers him healing. Now, notice in this story. So the first thing you notice is Jesus starts the encounter. This this isn't a man who's who's lying at the pool crying out to Jesus. So remember in the, in the previous story, the woman who was bleeding, she went to Jesus. She had some kind of faith. Uh, if Jesus is God, which I believe he is, then speaking to God is prayer. And so she prayed and she got healed, right? This man, there's no indication he had any faith. Matter of fact, he's laying by this pool and he gives an excuse when the, when the, when Jesus asks, do you want to get well? He, you know what he says? He goes, Hey, listen, I've never had any help, <laughs> right? If we ever met anyone like that, they've got a problem. They go, hey, hey, it's no one's ever helped me before. So he says, I've never had any help. I, I, I can't get the pool when it's stirred up. I can't get it at the right time to be healed. I've never had any help. So here's, here's a guy who's not only um, not, he didn't go out and seek out Jesus. He didn't appear to be a man of any faith. He didn't appear to be reaching out in prayer. He was just laying by the pool. You know, they, they'd go there and beg. So begging and, and, uh, and when, when Jesus asks him, you know, do you want to get well? Like, why aren't you well? He says, well, all these other people, no one's helped me. No one will help me. And Jesus' response is, pick up your mat, get up, walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. So Jesus miraculously heals this guy instantaneously. But what, where was the guy's faith? <laughs> like, you don't see it. The Bible doesn't hide this. This is an act of God. God shows to heal him. That's why you see it, Mark, uh, Mark uh, 545 down there. God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God does what he wants. I always say that. And, and he can choose to heal anyone. And he heals people all throughout time of all faiths, religions, genders, identities, everything. God heals. He heals. Why? Because he's the source of all healing. So anyone who's ever been healed of anything from a common cold to a serious deadly disease was healed at the hand of God. I firmly believe this. And uh, I, I added this next part in John 5. It says that the the day at which this pl uh, took place was a Sabbath. And the reason I added that, uh, it's in the scripture, um, but the religious people are, are angry because they have an idea of how God should work. And, and so they're angry because God shouldn't work through Jesus like this on the Sabbath because Jesus is supposed to be resting on the Sabbath. And, and so it's it's really interesting that right in this, in this passage um, where, where we see this man of no faith healed on the Sabbath, you see religious people going, it's the religious people going, that's not how this should work. That's not how God should work. It's like, listen, God heals who he wants, when he wants. Listen, God sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The Bible teaches that God heals everyone. All healing comes from him. I shouldn't say everyone in the sense that everyone. And so the man picked up his mat and walked. All healing comes from God. The Bible teaches this. And, and when it, it's some, a person who prays a prayer of faith, that's God doing the healing, whether at the hands of doctors or miraculously. And when it's someone who has no faith or even denies God, that is God doing the healing, whether it's at the hands of a, a miracle or the hands of the doctors. I have to be both miraculous, but you know what I mean. So hold on a sec, right? It, you may have noticed something. I started with a couple of verses and I seem to ignore them. So if you're <laughs> paying attention, maybe you're calling me out because I didn't address these problems yet. So what about this, though? Because what about what we started off with? You remember we started off with James 5, 13 through 16, which says, are any of you suffering hardships? Pray. Are you unhappy? Sing praise. Are you sick? Call on the other elders of the church to come and pray 
for you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord, and such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. So what about that? We just seem to ignore that, didn't I? And Isaiah 5, 35, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. What about that? I just seem to ignore those. Well, the first thing I want to say, and, and this is uh, I, this is not what I'm talking about today, so I'm just going to gloss over it in a second. But when, it, when in reference to James 5.13, I want you to hear the whole thing and really understand what's going on here. So James is saying, listen, you got problems, right? You something, pray. You're happy, sing praises. You're sick, call the elders of the church. Listen, um, a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And listen to what he says. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. So here's how he concludes this little section. He says, therefore, so knowing this, knowing what I just told you, confess your sins to each other and pray to each other so that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So um, what I believe, and I believe it's clear here, by the way, is talk is James is talking about uh, both a physical and a spiritual healing that comes from God based on your sins. And, and so... Um, there is, again, uh, many of us have experienced uh, sickness that comes in our life because of sin. And, and again, if you're a non-believer, that statement make, makes no sense to you because there's no such thing as sin. So, but for those of us who understand, um, is that we can get a sickness that comes from our sin. And, and James is saying, hey, go to the church about it. Get prayer about it. God will lift you up, is, is another translation. The Lord will make you well. He'll heal you from your sin. And that's why he says, confess your sins to each other and pray that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So sin plays a role. And that's what James is talking about. He's not just saying, anytime you're sick, just pray, go to the church and you're going to be healed. Um, or James has a problem because apparently he wasn't eventually healed because he's not with us anymore. Uh, so sin plays a role. Uh, so what about Isaiah 53, 5? But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed, they're talking about Jesus, for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. It seems like an absolute statement. You can't get around it. He doesn't say we might be healed. We could be healed. We should be healed. We will eventually be healed. He says we are healed. So how do you get out of that? Well, <laughs> you don't have to. Because the verse explains itself. It's actually something much more incredible. Listen to this. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was, about, was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Then we continue into the next verse, and it says this. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, let me translate that if, I, if I'm allowed to, <laughs> to say this. Jesus went to the cross and died. He suffered. He was beaten. He was bled and abused. Uh, he was turned on. He was abandoned. Um, why? Because I went astray. <laughs> because I sinned. I turned my own way. I became sick. I became sick. And God laid my sickness on him. He took the punishment for my sin. Because of Christ, I am set free and I am alive. By his wounds, I have been healed. And it's not a simple healing that will last me and give me 10 more years on this earth when I am facing whatever it is that finally takes my life. Um, it is a healing that lasts eternally. It is that new body, that mansion in heaven. Um, and I believe it. And the question is, um, what do you believe? The question is, um, do you know you're sick? <laughs> do you want to be well? That's what Jesus asked. And in order to want to be well, you need to know you're sick. And if you don't know you're sick, look at your life. Um, I don't think you've always done well. I think the Bible teaches that all have sinned. And if you're sick, Go to the doctor. <laughs> and Jesus says he's the great physician. He is the doctor for the sick. And he's a 100% success rate at making people well. All healing comes from God, but only, only 
God can provide eternal healing. Uh, whether again, uh, whether the physical healing it appears to come in the hands of the doctors or miraculous from God, I believe it's all from God, but all infinite, eternal, forever, however you want to phrase it, healing, true life, real life comes from God. And it's my hope and prayer that you today would put your faith in God and that you would be healed because all like sheep have gone astray. Me, you, every one of us has turned away from God. But he so loved the world that he sent his son, Jesus. He put his, our iniquities on Jesus that whoever believes in him would not die eternally, but would have life eternally in him. And I think that's a good news, a good reason to celebrate. And I thank you guys for letting me share today and putting up with me. Thank you, Pastor Chris, very much. I enjoyed that very immensely. Um, I remember a number of years ago when I visited a friend and went to her church that weekend. There was, they went to a sort of a Pentecostal type church. And that is not my forte as far as uh, church goes. So, but I pay, I just stayed and uh, was respectful and, and patient and they didn't get too overboard. The only thing that freaked me out was when uh, they said, okay, it's time to pray. And everybody all started praying at once. But um, after the service was over, a lady came up to me. She'd sat a few rows behind me. She came running up to me and she said, I'm so glad you came to our church today. She said, but I'm, I'm surprised that Brother Brandon didn't bring you up on the platform and pray for your healing. And I said, well, ma'am, I would not have gone because I've come to this place in, in my life where I know that God has made me the way I am for a reason. And uh, medically, I've been taken to a place where I can get around and do all the things I need to do. So I'm actually fine. Thank you very much. And she thanked me again for coming and went off. And my friend said, yeah, she, uh, she I, I was going to, I was hoping to keep you away from her. She's a, she's a follower of Benny Hinn. I went, oh, <laughs> that answers a whole slew of questions. <laughs> but it was, although un, unbalanced, it was a nice, nice church. The people were fine. And like I said, they didn't major on that part. So I didn't feel too uh, spiritually assaulted, should we say, or spiritually abused. But certainly that uh, the thing with, with, with healing, it can be used as a great um, tool of spiritual abuse for people. What's your take on that? Well, I think, uh, I think a good place to look for that is in John 4. Um, there's a, an official who wants his son to be healed. And... Um, he comes to Jesus and, and Jesus uh, heals his son miraculously from a distance. It's a really cool story. Yep. Um, but you remember what he first says to him? He, sa he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. Mm -hmm. So he kind of criticized and he says, listen, um, it, the idea was, was they needed this for their faith. Like, um, hey, what are you going to, like, what are you going to do, God, to continue to prove yourself to me so I could believe in you? And I think, I think, unfortunately, that can happen to a lot of us at times. It, it's, um, you know, we have faith and then, you know, something happens or, you know, we don't understand something. And it's like, okay, God, we prove yourself to us again. You know, uh, when God, for me, proved himself once and for all at the cross, um, man, because <laughs> I was dead in my sin. I was dead mm -hmm. and I was made alive. And, um so I, and, and I understand that's nonsense to someone who it's foolishness. Like the Bible says to someone who hasn't experienced it. Uh, but it's real for me because I've experienced it when I've experienced it is real. Um, but again, you, you have, you, and you see this throughout scripture where, where people demand a sign people, they just need something to feed their faith. And, um, and yes, it can cause like, like, again, that's why I use the example of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Um, you can get people, and we can fall into it too, right, Carrie? Where you get into mm -hmm. a religious mindset, <laughs> and, you, and you forget right. what this is about. Uh, you, you walking with Jesus, your friend, um, serving God the Father, and, and being thankful for life, and, and just enjoying enjoying life. I really believe that's part of it. And um, and we don't have to seek a sign and wonder to have faith in God. Um, he's evident in creation, as the Bible says. 
but mostly he lives in me. Like, I believe that. Like, yeah. so all I have to do is look inside myself and it's very clear. And, and, uh, and I understand too, that, that, um, you know, you know, Pentecost, it's obvious, you know, God will use signs and wonders to, to, to uh, validate his message. And it seems that early on in church history, you have a bunch of disciples of Jesus who are being scattered and going out and sharing the word. And, um, you know, they don't have a Bible in their hands. Mm -hmm. Okay. They don't have the general knowledge. Listen, um, for most of the world, yes, not all the world, for most of the world, there's a general knowledge of Jesus and who he is and what he did. I'm not saying, you know, I run into people all the time who've never heard of Jesus in a sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so uh, the message today, as we go out and take the message today, um, we're backed by millions, maybe billions. I, I just don't know. I haven't looked at the number, right? We're backed by millions. And so, uh, but when these first disciples, apostles go out, just a couple of them at a place or one at a place, um, and they're saying, hey, I saw this guy resurrect from the dead. Their response would be, you know, like any other person's response, baloney, proven, <laughs> right? I mean, that's what I'd say. You know, mm -hmm. what's one guy telling you someone resurrected from the dead? Well, then, then all of a sudden they're healing people. It's like, oh, and they're speaking different languages, or at least they're hearing their language. It's like, oh. And so there, there's, there was clearly a reason for God to do that and move that way. Right. And, uh, and so, so again, I'll say this at a faith healing service, God can heal who he wants when he wants. Can someone right. come to a faith serving healing, faith healing service, even Benny Hinn and go up and they, they go up on stage and they're completely healed. Absolutely. Absolutely. That can happen. I 100% believe that can happen. Just as I believe someone can go to the surgeon and have the cancer removed. If it's the right praise God for both, <laughs> but, but yeah, we don't want to use those things to abuse. You don't want to use those things to abuse people. I think uh, Chris uh, blinked out there for a minute somehow, but uh, I'm just, you okay? No. Okay. We'll see if you, we'll see if brother Chris comes back. I'm just going to springboard off that and suggest, I know that maybe, uh, I don't know if we want to recommend things over here, but uh, the program Grace to You did a great series of messages called Strange Fire about oh, could it be, could have been seven to ten years ago now uh, that they're all they're all available for free on the internet at grace you.org and grace then then the number two and then you y o u grace to you.org and look for the strange fire series and especially the that the, one of the great ones is Johnny Erickson Tata who many of you may know she was uh, made a quadriplegic at 16 in a diving accident and that was in the 1970s and she speaks on the topic called A Greater Healing, which I think would benefit a lot of you to go out there and listen. Again, it's the Strange Fire Conference at gracetoyou.org. I'll just recommend those from my perspective over here. I don't see any other questions for Pastor Chris. I don't know, did uh, Pastor Chris wind up dropping off? It looks like he did. Uh, maybe he'll come back, maybe he won't, but I don't see any other uh, questions at the moment. If anyone has any, feel free to uh, send them to the chat box. And, or to our Facebook group. I'll just do one more quick little tech check of those here. <clears throat> I think I'm back, Carrie. Hi, Chris. Did you have more to add? I, I, I've tried to, oh. I recommended uh, the Grace to You Strange Fire Conference and especially the, uh, jet, the message that Johnny Erickson Tata gave about a deeper healing, which would really speak to some of the things that you're talking about today. So did you have anything more to say? I don't have anything more to say other than I think we were finishing on the note just that, um, you know, we sometimes we can abuse and misuse the word of God to to abuse people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, but more importantly, even maybe um, we can twist the word to say something it doesn't say. And and again, how do we know we're not the ones guilty of that? Well, um, <laughs> when you read the word of God, it, it seems to me and this this may be an error in my part. I don't know that most things are pretty plainly stated and that when you read things um, simply like a child would maybe like you just go through like a kid and, and say, well, this is what it says. Um, mm -hmm. Even with those verses that seem to be problematic, like James, it's like, if you read it through, it's, it's, it says it, you know, mm -hmm. again, like, like with healing for those people who, who kind of have this idea that God will always heal a man of faith. It's like, well, the Bible's really clear that didn't happen. Like it's yeah. not, 
it's not some kind of vague metaphorical or I don't know how to even, but it's very clear. <laughs> and so, so um, yeah, I think we have to be really careful because sometimes, and I do this and you do this, we all do this. Sometimes there's something we want so badly. Like I, I want so badly um, to believe that some people I lo know and love, um, and, and forgive me for saying this, Carrie, but I think you'll understand. I want so badly to think there's another way for them to get into heaven. I know that sounds offensive. Okay. We all do. Okay. I, I mean, because I know Jesus is the only way and I believe that and I'm 100% mm -hmm. sold out on that. But, but man, <laughs> I don't want to mm -hmm. believe that when, when, when I have friends who are Muslim. Right. I, I, I want to believe, well, you know, it's a similar Abrahamic God, you know, um, <laughs> they share some Old Testament truths. Yeah, that's what I want to believe. I really do. I know. You yeah. know, and, and so sometimes, but if I'm not careful, I can let that cross over into how I interpret the Bible. And, and so I can go, this is what I want to believe. And this seems to fit what I want to believe. And therefore, let's make it work, God, <laughs> you know. Right? Do we have a deal? You know what I mean? Like, hey, I want it to work this way. It looks like it's possible. You know, can we make a deal? And it just yeah. doesn't work that way. We've, uh, we've, I've heard that quote from before. I just found it again from uh, David Platt, 2015. It's, it's from the uh, counterculture following Christ in an anti Christian age. He says, if there were a thousand ways to God, we would want a thousand and one. I sure would. I really would. <laughs> because what matters is those who love, who, who I love, you know, yes. I mean, um, and it's interesting because it seems like God gave us his heart because it's not my heart that one should perish. Mm -hmm. And that came from God because <laughs> that's his heart. We, we, we yeah. hear his word. And so at, um, at the same time, there's only one way, yep. only one way. And so I'm glad that you are here with us uh, repeatedly to call people to that one way and to help us to understand the word more. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to Sister Judy for some concluding thoughts and to close our meeting in a word of prayer today. Thanks, Carrie. Whatever physical pain you may be feeling, whatever physical condition you are in, and whatever circumstance you may be in, the greatest need any of us has is forgiveness of sins. And Jesus is able to forgive all your sins, past, present, and future, through our simple faith in Christ. Trust him. The greatest healing that we can ever have is being healed from our sins so we don't spend eternity in hell. And like Pastor Chris had talked about earlier, sin is any violation of God's law, even if it's just a simple bad thought. First Peter 2.24 says, who himself bore our sorrows in his own body on the tree, that we being, that we having died to sins might live for forgiveness by whose stripes you were healed. Receiving Jesus is not something we achieve. It is something we accept. We have to accept that we are sinners and that we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ as God's son who died for our sins and rose from the dead to give us eternal life. When we believe this and act in faith, we become a child of God and our eternal home is secure where there will be no sickness or death. If you have any questions about becoming a child of God, just message any one of us hosts and we would love to talk to you. All right, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. And thank you for bringing us all from all parts of the world um, onto this platform to learn more about you, Lord. Thank you for allowing Pastor Chris to speak today. Um, and thank you for sending your son into this world to die for our sins and for giving us the eternal healing that we need so that our souls won't perish. We pray for each and every one of us this coming week. Bless us this coming week. Um, and we pray for the next session as well, Lord. Thank you for everything you've given to us, O oh Lord. Um, and keep us safe this coming week. In Jesus' name I pray. Mm -hmm.